ask questions to all the panelists. So please uh, get ready to ask some good questions for the final discussion at uh, 6.30. Now it is my pleasure to uh, introduce Shi Qin Shu. Um, I hope I pronounce correctly. Uh, so please, please go ahead. Please start your presentation. I'm very much looking forward to it. I share on the screen. So can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, so I want to thank Wolfram for inviting me here to talk about our recent talks and our recent works. And part of my talk is very similar to what Burfan has uh, talked about. So uh, this work is uh, many work, uh, a, a joint work with Zhang Yaoyu and Luo Tao and some of my colleagues. Uh, so we know that neural network has a very great expressive power. Single hidden layer neural network can almost fit any function. But this is not enough because what we want is not only fitting, we want a generalization. So now let's take a look at the traditional generalization theory. Yeah, suppose we are going to classify two types of data and we may use a, a linear function and end up with not a good uh, either training error or generalization error. And if we use a more oscillated curve, yes, we can uh, classify the training data very well, but we can incur very large generalization error. So traditional generalization uh, theory says that if you increase the model complexity, you may decrease the training error, but at the same time, after some point, you will increase the test error. So there will be a generalization gap you may choose an optimal complexity such as this function can better uh, classify the data and also generate well. But this may not apply in deep neural networks. Since 90, uh, 1995, there is a generalization puzzle that neural network can generate rather well even the number of parameters is much larger than the number of training data. So in, 19, in 2016, Zhang Siyuan and and their colleagues shows an experiment that if you use a very large networks to fit like CIFAR 10 data, you can get a very good accuracy and also not a bad tech, uh, test accuracy. Actually, many people has already uh, knew this something result like this, but this work has systematically performed experiments to confirm this puzzle. So this attracted a lot of attention. So we try to understand why from the training process of neural network. Let's take a look at, at a, an example of one dimensional function fitting. So suppose we use a neural network to fit this red curve target function. And the blue curve is the output of neural network. This will be a movie and each frame will be several training uh, steps. So as we can see that a neural network can capture the, loss, the landscape of the target function very quickly. And after some time, there is more and more detailed structures. So you will learn from lost landscape, from landscape to detail. So naturally, it will be uh, easy to use frequency to describe this landscape and detail. So we uh, perform Fourier transform of both target function and also the neural network output. This red curve is the uh, FFT of the target function. And this blue curve is the FFT of the neural network output. Similarly, this is also a movie. And we can see that the neural network captures a low frequency very quickly. And after some time, it captures more and more frequency. So we conclude from very simple experiment that a frequency principle that neural network learns data from low frequency to high frequency. And not only us, but also many other works has shown experiments that this frequency principle is quite universal and also some theory. So we can apply this frequency principle to understand the generalization uh, puzzle. So in this experiment, and we know that uh, neural network can perform rather well in like MNIST or CIFAR-10 imaging classification task. And if we perform a Fourier transform of this classification function in some direction or projection, this Fourier uh, domain function into one dimension, we can see that 
in the image classification task, the target function actually is low frequency dominant. And the neural network uh, indicated by this blue dashed curve is also uh, low frequency dominant. It prefers low frequency. So it can learn low frequency very well, but the high frequency part, the training data and the test data already has some uh, different and the neural network cannot well learn this high frequency, but it's not important. So the neural network can generate very well in such low frequency dominant function. But for another function, this function called a parity function is defined on minus one and one in each dimension. And the output is the product of each dimension. So it's called a parity function because it's equivalent to account the number of minus one if it's even number of minus one, its output is one, otherwise it's minus one. In function, we change input, the output will have a significant change, so a high frequency function. In such a case, the neural network will capture a false low frequency due to the sampling and will have a very small portion of high frequency. So the finally learned function, the blue curve is very different from the target function. So in this case, the neural network has no generalization ability. So this example shows that we start from frequency perspective. We can uh, understand it qualita uh, qualitatively, but not quantitatively uh, understand why the neural network can generate well in some task, but not in other tasks. So we have a very simple conclusion that neural network learns data from low frequency to high frequency, or simply if no need, the neural network will add no more frequency. And this resembles the orgasm's razor. However, this frequency principle is too constrained. We found that it's not able to capture all details. So here is an experiment. Suppose we use a two layer neural network to fit a uh, one-dimensional function only have four data points as in the training data. We use the different uh, initialization scheme and we found that all these three cases, they follow the frequency principle that is from low frequency to high frequency, but the function they finally learned are very, very different. And we want to look into more, de uh, more de de detailed things about this uh, learning process. So we check the, the weight of neural networks after learning. So we care about the input weight and also uh, the amplitude of each neuron. Since we study the ReLU neuron, so its amplitude of the input weight is not important because it's a homogeneous function. We can take its amplitude out, uh, outside the function so we only care about the direction of this input weight w and also the amplitude is the amplitude of a times the w and this this w the direction of w if we only care about if we only uh, do experiment in one dimensional input then this w actually is a two dimensional vector sorry it's a two dimensional vector the input weight and also the bias term so we can use an orientation angle to represent this input weight, the direction. So the x-axis is the orientation and the y is the amplitude. And in the uh, linear regime or the NTK regime, we can see that the red is the, uh, the, the green one is the initialization parameter distribution and the red one are the parameters after training, we can see that in the initial, in the linear regime, the initial parameter and the final parameter are very close. This is consistent with uh, what we have learned from linear regime. And in the mean field regime, that in the initialization is small, is small. Uh, we can see that after training, the parameters, they have some condensation, but not extremely condensed. The orientation has only uh, condensed at some uh, few uh, few values, but still have some other values at uh, some orientations. If we continue to uh, decrease the initialization uh, magnitude of parameters, 
we can see that after uh, normalization, almost uh, all the parameters, the input width, they condensed in the two directions. So it's a very, very strange phenomenon when we observe it, it at the first beginning, and we try to understand why. But before we understand why, we want to ask what condensation benefits or why the neural network, um, what may, why would a neural network want to condense? So suppose this is a neural network uh, with random initialization and the weight are randomized at the initial, uh, in the initial state. After some training, uh, there's a condensation uh, happening. So what's the condensation? We uh, draw a cartoon here. That means for extremely case, they're condensed in only one direction. That means for each input neuron, its input weight to every hidden neurons are exactly the same. So this neural network actually is a uh, very uh, is a reducible neural network as called in the Burfin's talk. So we can actually reduce this neural network into a very small effective neural network. That is only one hidden neural network. So it's an effective network is very small. So now let's go back to this uh, puzzle. We ask the question, is there really so many effective neurons in large networks? For example, in this very simple case, although we use 10,000 neurons in this example, but actually two ReLU neuron network, two ReLU neurons actually are enough to express this, uh, this function. So we can see that after training, the neural network actually converged to a very small effective neural network. Uh, we want to ask how general, how general of this uh, phenomenon exists in training neural networks. So we study the initialization and different, we study which kind of initialization can, can, can uh, finally converge to such condensation phenomena. So we study a two neuron network with ReLU activation function and an implant with limit. So the problem can be uh, clear and very e easier to study. So we study this two, two layer neural network with parameters alpha, alpha AK and WK here. And AK and WK are initialized from a Gaussian distribution with some uh, standard deviation. And we normalize this uh, gradient flow for each parameters by their magnitude and the initialization. And there are three, three parameters and we don't care about how fast the neural network evolve. So we only, we only care about in the final state. So we can eliminate the variable of time. So we only need to care about two parameters. So we find the two uh, scaling parameters. And these two parameters actually can control the initialization enough. So we found that either these two hyperparameters, we can summarize some uh, the current uh, many current studies of uh, influence with a uh, limit. For example, in this uh, blue part is called a linear regime. Their behavior are very similar to NDK. And either this uh, uh, critical uh, boundary line is very similar to the behavior of mean field. And, and this green part is another regime. We call it condensed regime because in this regime, neurons will condense. So here's an example of MNIST data set. And we also use two layer neuron network. Uh, we found that in this regime, when we increase the neuron numbers, when the neural number goes to infinity, the condensation is more and more clear. So the condensation is a very uh, kind of universal phenomenon in the neural network, especially uh, we observe in this infinite width limit. So this phenomenon actually gives us another result that if no need, the neural network in some initialization regime will select, will uh, use no more effective neurons. So it also resembles the orgasm's razor, small net, or maybe effective 
small network is effective. So now let's get back to uh, this um, picture. Now, original neural network is very large. And actually, after learn, learning or training, the neural network is very similar to a two-layer, uh, a two-relu neural network. So why we need to use so much energy to train a two, a very large neural network? Why we don't just use a two-relu neural network? So what's the difference between these two kinds of neural network? Is there any similarity or difference? So we study their similarity and difference in this talk from Lost Landscape. So we know the Lost Landscape is very complicated, just like if we have a very uh, complicated traffic. And if there is no light, this load will be very clouded. And if there is a traffic light and every car or people goes under the lure of light, so everyone can run smoothly. Similarly, in the lost landscape, it's very complicated. But actually, in the practice training, we found the training, it seems not so complicated. It seems there's some guidance in the neural network, and the training can be easy. So who can be a traffic place placement in the, new, in the lost landscape? Now, let's take a look at this uh, example. Suppose, uh, the training may start from an initial state to a final stage. But if during the trajectory, you have some subtle point, and this subtle point will attract the training trajectory, but it also will slow down the training. This is a characteristic of the subtle point. Now let's take another viewpoint for training process. Previously, we look at it at a, a forward domain. Now let's just look at a spatial domain. So the target training data is in the blue dots and the network is in the red solid curve. So we found that after some training, its output is very similar to a single neural network is optimal. And after a long time training, its output is very similar to the three neural network optimum. And we, we are wondering why it will go through this uh, like single neuron optimum or three neuron uh, network optimum. So we take a look at its uh, training loss. This is the training loss of this 500, 500 neuron network. So we can see that during the training, it will go through a plateau. At this plateau, the training is very small and the neural network output here indicated by, by this red solid curve, it almost overlaps with the, the optimum output of the one neural network. So it seems that in the five neural network case, the optimal output of the one neural network is a critical point or a subtle point in the 500 neural network. And similarly, after long training, its output is similar or very similar to this uh, three neural networks. We define, usually we define critical point in a parameter space. If a parameter is a critical point, if the uh, gradient of the loss with respect to the parameter at this point is zero. However, in these examples, we can consider in another way, the critical points somehow is related to the output. In some sense, we can define the critical points by the output, but not the parameters. If in this way, uh, we can see that the critical points of wider neural network should contain or should see the critical points of narrow neural networks. We can have a conjecture that the training of the a large network will go through the small networks optimum to large networks optimum. It has some order, just like frequency principle from low frequency to high frequency. So it will go from initial and then goes to some uh, one neural network optimum and three and so on. So this is our conjecture. So, but 
to have this conjecture uh, stand, we actually need a basis that is in the lost landscape, the optimum function of small network is a critical function of large network. And we train the more neural networks with different width. So we can see that almost uh, all neural networks, they can go through some uh, plateaus at the same, almost the same loss value. And their output at this point actually very similar. So this uh, further confirms our conjecture. So we propose an embedding principle that is the loss landscape of any network contains all critical points of nano networks. Okay, we can use this simple example to explain this. Suppose for a very uh, for one neural network, its loss landscape may be like this. And when you add one more neurons, this point will change from local minimum to subtle point. And its local minimum or global minimum is a one with smaller loss. And if you add one more neuron, and this point will become another subtle point, and its uh, optimal point will have a lower loss. So how to prove this? This is almost exactly the same as Bowen's uh, talk, but this actually uh, in our work, we inspired by this inverse process of the uh, condensation. In the condensation, we have a lot of neurons and they condense, but here to prove this embedding principle, we can split a small neural network, network to a large network. Here's an example of adding one neuron. And if you want to add more neurons, you can consist of uh, multiple steps of one uh, step embedding. So in this case, we want to split this black neuron. So we split this neuron into two neurons and the input weights are copied and the output, output weights are split uh, by a ratio of alpha. And this ratio is, uh, uh, this ratio applies for each neuron uh, to ensure the criticality preserving. So we have this theorem under one step embedding, we have the output of the nano neural network is the same as the wide neural network. And if the parameters in the nano neural network is a critical point, either saddle point or local minimum or global minimum, the, net, the parameter embedded from this nano neural network is also a critical point, but maybe in different types. So this is an inverse of condensation. So this is one step embedding is very similar to a previous work like Fukumizu and Amri and also Simsek's work. And we also propose recently, we also propose a more general embedding, not only one neuron uh, added by uh, one neuron by another, but added by a bunch of neurons. So here's an example. For example, in this case, we split uh, the neurons in the previous layer and also in the uh, next layer into several neurons. In this case, they are split into three neurons. So in this case, to preserve the output, so the input from the previous neuron to the post neuron, their coefficient should have a summation of one. This is to, to preserve the output. But we also need to preserve the criticality. So we can compute the gradient of the loss function with respect to the output of this neuron. This will be uh, consist of two parts. One is the blue neuron, the other is the green and uh, the red neuron. And similarly, in after splitting, the gradient of the loss function with respect to this uh, uh, purple neuron should also consist of several parts, the blue part and also the red part to ensure that the summation of all these parts equals to zero. And our what we know is that this two parts summation is zero. So if uh, we have some coefficient of the summation of this uh, blue part, their coefficient should be same. That means we can compute the 
gradient of the loss function with the new with respect to the output of this new neurons, this new neuron by also by two paths. And we can take out their coefficient for each part, blue part and the red part. And to ensure this summation is still uh, equals to zero, we need to re require that the coefficient for each part should be the same. So we can take out the common uh, factor, this beta, and then this summation inside can also can uh, can be e can be equal to zero based on the condition of uh, the criticality in the previous smaller neural network. And we can discuss the dimension of the critical manifold on lost landscape after embedding from a smaller neural network to k neuron wider neural network. At least you will have a k-dimensional critical uh, affine subspace. Just like here, um, you have a one point uh, critical point after embedding, you will be one dimensional and after a uh, two step embedding in the one, uh, in the first one step embedding, you will have a, a plane. So in a wide network, the simple critical function, that means it can embed it from a, a more uh, narrow neural network can form a higher dimension manifold. So here is a cartoon that says, um, if the, in 500 neural network, if this critical point is embedded from one neural network, at least it has uh, 499 dimension. Uh, and when you, um, when the uh, critical point is embedded from a larger network, it's, its manifold will decrease. So this is a partial order for multiple layer neural network. And for the channel uh, embedding, we don't have an exact estimation of the dimension, but we have some guess. That is, um, K is the total uh, uh, neurons added in the wide, uh, added in the nano neural network. And KL is the number added in the L's layer. So uh, this is a guess of uh, uh, the dimension. And we have a theorem says, uh, uh, this is all very, very similar to previous uh, Berfin's talk, that the number of positive, zero or negative eigenvalues is in the hyphen of the nano neural network, of the uh, large net, wide neural network, is no less than the uh, counterparts of the nano neural networks hyphen matrix. And we from some experience sure degeneracy in two neural network and to learn the data. And after learning, all eigenvalues of the hyphen are positive. That means it's a local minimum or it's a global minimum. And after we embedded this neural network to three neural network, there will be one eigenvalue very, very small. Uh, we can regard it as zero. And also we found that an eigenvalue actually turns from uh, negative, from uh, positive to uh, negative. We have a negative eigenvalue and we embed it to wider neural network. There will be more negative uh, eigenvalue. That means that in larger networks, the critical points may have more uh, uh, descent direction. That may explain why wider neural network is easier for training because uh, there may be no local minimum but side of points and has more and more uh, descent direction. But we are also thinking about is there any uh, true battery critical point? Uh, that means uh, at this, uh, for this point, no matter how, uh, how many embeddings, it always uh, local minimum do not have any negative. It's possible, but we have this theorem. If we decompose this Heisen matrix into two parts, and this decomposition is very natural. If the second part does not equal to zero, and you will have a embedding that after embedding, there will be a negative eigenvalue. So you will turns into a strict saddle point. 
So finally, I will use a cartoon to summarize our understanding from this uh, uh, hierarchical structure of loss landscape. At a, during the training neural network, you have uh, initial parameters, maybe very chaos, and the loss landscape is very complicated. But during the training, you have some guidance from the nano neural networks critical point. Maybe first you will go to a one neural network critical point, then to the two neurons critical point, and so and so and so and so on. And maybe sometimes you will just pass through this uh, some middle critical point and directly go to some uh, larger neural network. And finally, you arrive your destiny. Destiny. And we also show that this uh, condensation is uh, also uh, can be easier easily observed in uh, neural network with uh, training on and this data set. In these examples, we show that a lot of neural networks, their directions has a very high uh, correlations. Their direction are very uh, aligned together. So we can uh, prune the neural network and get a very similar result. So finally, I, will, I want to use this picture to conclude uh, my talk. The neural network's loss landscape is not as easy as a convex function. Also, it's not so complicated as a prof protein folding uh, loss landscape. It may have some spatial hierarchy structure that enable us to uh, train it well. So this will be uh, my final uh, uh, slide. That is the embedding principle, the loss landscape of any network contains all critical points of all nano neural networks will serve a basis for the condensation, a path for gradually increasing the number of effective neurons. Okay, I will end my talk here. Thank you very much for this great talk, very nicely presented. We have uh, some questions from the attendees. Do you yeah, want I can to see it. Directly yeah, I, I can read it. I can read it. What about the weight of decay uh, regularization? Yeah, so far we don't study the, any uh, uh, regularization. We believe that if you add some regularization, uh, you will change the uh, loss landscape structure. Uh, but so far I cannot answer this question. Uh, okay, like in the feature distribution shown in the condensed regime, I assume that's for two layer. Yeah, it's a for two layer neural network. Is there a related empirical evidence of condensation of and deeper neural networks? Yes, we have performed. We have a recent uh, work in. Uh, you can check it in my uh, homepage that we uh, can observe this condensation at a very deep and also at the rest residue uh, neural network. But one condition is if you want to see a clear condensation, you need to uh, require your initialization be very small. Okay. In case there is no any finite critical points, can we still uh, use narrow neural network? In case there is no any finite critical, there is no any finite, what's the meaning of no any finite critical points. There could be, uh, actually don't understand what's the meaning of no finite, what's the meaning of finite critical points. Maybe you can say more about this. Oh, uh, yeah. You also, yeah, yeah I, may, I may get your point. Uh, actually here, I don't require, I don't require this critical points to be global minimum. I only require this point is a critical point. So if you have a very, very uh, nano networks, even one neural networks, you can have critical points. Definitely you will have critical uh, points because you have uh, this uh, uh, global minimum, maybe this minimum, maybe, maybe not able to uh, well uh, fit your uh, curve or your data, but it's the minimum. So you can use the uh, nano neural network if I understand it correctly. Um, does the objective function play a role in shaping the loss landscape together with the time? So far, uh, our results are rather general you know, for uh, the loss function. So for the objective function, but for the cross entropy, there will be something uh, should be very careful because for cross entropy function, um, if we want to get the global minimum, 
you need to go to infinity uh, training time on the way that should go to infinity. But for the critical points, not a global minimum, the result should apply. You mentioned the mean field, uh, you mentioned the mean field of parameterization and NTK parameterization in first diagram. Where does the standard, uh, uh, the standard uh, parameterization lie? Okay, I can show this uh, picture. So standard uh, may be something like a, uh, uh, like a uh, Davia or like uh, the coin initialization. Uh, if you uh, increase the number of neurons goes to infinity, you, uh, this uh, initialization scheme actually lies in a linear regime. Does the choice of the loss function also impact on that? Yeah, we we test some uh, loss length, uh, loss function like uh, um, like uh, um, x square. Uh, uh, no, x four, x to four times x four, x uh, to x more than four. Uh, not a quadratic uh, uh, loss function. Very similar results, but it's not easy to train. And during our proof, actually, it's not a so uh, this hierarchy structure. Uh, it's not so related to the choice of loss function. Uh, if you want to prove some um, about some of these uh, eigenvalue things, you uh, this Heisen, if you require, you may require some uh, derivative condition for activation function. Yeah, this is my answer. And is there any question in the panel? Yes, I think there's some questions in the panel. Verifins. Uh, please go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the very nice presentation. I, I had a question about the um, saddles and with the negative eigenvalues, because uh -huh. uh, you, you really emphasize the number of negative eigenvalues. But what I gather from non-convex optimization literature is what matters is the most negative eigenvalue uh -huh. uh, more. But I, I wonder your intuition on this. Oh, you mean uh, the number of negative eigenvalues, right? Uh, I was thinking about the other figure with the red dots and blue dots. Oh, this one. Oh, sorry. This one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a... Uh, okay, this shows the experimental result that um, there will be uh, more negative uh, eigenvalues. But we... Theoretically, what we can prove is the number of... Uh, this is the only thing we can prove so far. And this is a result of uh, experiment. And we actually don't understand uh, in which case or in what condition there will be more and more negative eigenvalues. Yeah, we, we are not so clear for this. Uh, but we can show that if you have uh, this condition, if you have this, uh, yeah, if you have this condition, uh, this the second part, this part, it's not equals to zero. You can construct a, a uh, critical embedding that uh, after the embedding, there will be at least one negative eigenvalue. So this, uh, we need, need this uh, condition. Clément, you have a question? Yes, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, so uh, just a small question about the number of effective neurons that you, you see. I mean, you see patterns in the way the effective number of neurons increases. Uh, in along the training, I mean, you went from one to three in your example, for instance. So you you have some jumps. Uh, do you, you mean like this? Yeah, like this. But so this is on a, a fairly synthetic example, but uh, do you see kind of patterns in the way uh, oh. this number increases. We we in uh, in some real uh, experimental data like uh, like this. Uh, yeah, like this one. We actually can see at the first beginning, you only condense at a very few neurons. And during the training, there will be more and more neurons. Yeah. Of course, but uh, I mean, in the way, I mean, you increase one by one usually in these examples. No, no, uh, no, 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 one by one. No. As, as I mentioned, you can just, you can go bypass some uh, middle stage. And usually it bypass some middle stage. Like in the previous examples, you directly go open it directly goes from one to three. Right, right, right. 
So, but you usually jump by two or a few? No, or... I, we, we don't know. This uh, uh, dynamical process, actually, we don't fully understand. Oh. Okay. Great. If there are no more questions, we're perfectly on time. Thank you, Xi Jin, very much for the talk okay. and uh, answering all those questions.